People of God, y'all all right? Good, good, good. Listen, uh, it is a Saturday, the day before the eve before Easter. Jesus Christ is still in the grave, all right? Um, at the time of this recording, if you go to, I don't know, ABC, it seems like they have carte blanche license on the Ten Commandments is playing right now. So if there's only two or three people who are showing up to this live, it's because they're over there watching the Ten Commandments and what is Easter without Ten Commandments, all right? Uh, Cease will beat the meal. I'm ready for my line. Uh, and so I would be watching it too if I wasn't doing this. It's amazing how you can watch something uh, for 50 years and never get tired of it, as long as it's only once a year. Uh, listen, uh, it's a lot of teaching going on. Tonight. I have to do a lot of teaching, but a lot of reading in order to get the understanding of this whole three-day thing. And what the Sunday school lesson decided to do by bringing in Hosea chapter six, uh, they might've made a mistake. I don't know. Let's look at it and research it for ourselves and see if we can bring Hosea chapter six together with Luke chapter 24. And then look at the, it seemed like the, the, um, the gospels are fighting. There's some inconsistencies on when Jesus came out the grave. Whoo. Let's talk about that in 60. You're good. You're good. You're good. You're good. Don't stop. Bass. It's the show that will get you thinking. And where the topics are hot. Feel free to comment. Whether we agree or not. Cause A week, always on time, but this time is not free. So, Walter Jones, always on sleep. Latest trending topics had you jumping out your seat. He's got something to say. Come on in, the water's fine. Hello, everybody. So, Walter, so Walter Jones Show. I'm here. It is the evening edition, weekend edition, baby. Come on in, the water's fine, water's fine. All right, for those of y'all who are watching the Ten Commandments, uh, put it on pause. Don't worry, it'll still be there. If you, if you got the if you got the the app or if you got the DVRs, what have you, pause it. <laughs> Come over here. Let's see if we can get this all checked out. All right, uh, that thing when I was born, Ten Commandments was already ten years old. That's how old it is. All right, so that thing came out in the fifties, fifty six. When was that? Uh, somebody put it there. All right, so it, it, it's pretty old. Now look at this. <sighs> Current. Current events. The Republicans and those in the conservative right are a little upset because President Biden has instituted tomorrow, Easter, as Transgender Visibility Day. <laughs> all right, all right. <clears throat> oh, they're upset. They're quite upset. My brother Marshall sent me this. Uh, in wokeness, okay, these are the days that we have visibilities and asexual days and uh, lesbian visibility day, Harvey Milk Day, pansexual, pan romantic awareness day, Stonewall Day, international LGBTQ plus day, binary people day, Drag Day, Bisexual Day, Week, that is, International Lesbian Day, National Coming Out Day, Gender Fluid Visibility Week, International Pronoun Day, <laughs> Transparent Day, <laughs> Transgender Day of Remembrance. Yeah, you go ahead, y'all go ahead and Google this. Go ahead and Google this. These are days. <laughs> these, these are days. And I don't know no other group that that gets this kind of of recognition. I don't know no other I don't know no other group that get this kind of praise and recognition for deciding to have affection <laughs> for someone that is of the same gender. We are 
at a crossroads that I never thought I'd see. But I'm going to say something very controversial to y'all. Y'all ready for it? Y'all ready? I'm glad it's happening. I'm so glad it's happening. Um, look at this. I'm going to show y'all um, kind of how silly it is to be upset about tomorrow being Easter and transgender visibility today, uh, day, even though, I mean, as if Biden just did it. Uh, let the news source speak for themselves. All right. Tomorrow is Easter, of course, and this year it falls on March 31st. Now, years ago, President Biden declared that March 31st trans day of visibility, uh, sort of awareness for transgender issues. Republicans do not like that this is happening on Easter. So what is the White House saying? Well, and this is another example of how transgender rights has become a contentious issue. Now, Republicans, as you mentioned, have slammed that this day is going to fall on Easter. But we should note that this day, the Transgender Day of Visibility, always falls on March 31st. It just so happens that this year, Easter is going to be on the same day. Easter, of course, often changes year by year. Now, in a statement, White House spokesperson Andrew Bates said the following, quote, as a Christian who celebrates Easter with family, President Biden stands for bringing people together and upholding the dignity and freedoms of every American. Sadly, it's unsurprising politicians are seeking to divide and weaken our country with cruel, hateful and dishonest rhetoric. President Biden will never abuse his faith for political purposes or for profit. Of course, one of those politicians who slammed the move was House Speaker Mike Johnson. But again, the Transgender Day of Visibility has always fallen on March 31st. President Biden recognized it in a proclamation for the first time in 2021 and has done so every year since then. Easter again so happens to also fall on March 31st this year. You all get it now? It's a nothing burger. <laughs> it's a nothing burger. Um, even if he had done that, on purpose, I would not be surprised that he would do something like that. And I know people, many of you are saying, isn't he a Catholic? That should say something in itself, right? <laughs> he is professed Catholic like many of us who say we're Christians, but yet do everything else non-Christian-like. So once you become a politician, it is difficult to stand on the ground of your faith. You understand? On the grounds of your faith, it's very difficult to stand on that if you're going to go into the public sphere. All right. So next year, Easter will be on another day. You'll have something else to fight about. <laughs> Meanwhile, I'm so glad that that this did happen because what does it do? It wakes up apologetics like you all. It stirs up righteous indignation in you. And it ushers in prophecy. It ushers in prophecy. Yeah. Are you playing CNN and that supported the what? That's supposed to rid us of concern. <laughs> Come on, Grace Church. <laughs> Did you hear what I said, Grace Church? Code, and you Kojic too? Come on, man. I played CNN. What do you think? Because I played CNN, they are incorrect. Is that what you're saying? Are they incorrect? You see, when you all are correct, even though I may not like stuff that y'all say, I promote you. Atheists say a lot of stuff that's correct, and I put it on the show. You know what? Remember I played last week the Young Turks and that, that girl was talking about how she hates your Bible, but there's something she said that was correct. And I said, you know, she's right. She's right. So should I have played Fox News or MSNBC or should I play some other news, uh, ABC maybe because it's more trusted? Hmm? Should I have played Walter Cronkite because he's more trusted on this subject? Is it because I played CNN? You didn't like it? Hmm? She was right. Next year, it won't fall on this day. You all are going to fight over something else. I'm glad that these gays and these politicians are lining up with the gays. Why? Because it's stirring up anger in you. I'm glad that prayer has been taken out of the school. Do you understand? 
because y'all are pushing prayer to be put back into the school and you're setting your children up for some demonic mess. Hmm? So is Fox. So is Fox. They are extremely right. Not even a news source, many of those men on there, not, and the ones who were news sources on Fox left. They couldn't take it anymore. Someone like a Chris Wallace or someone, they couldn't take it anymore. They had to leave. Trust it. They were trusted, but the rest of them are just going by what the, their political agenda is. CNN and MSNBC are liberals. Are you new to the show, my dear brother? Liberal. But guess what? I've played all three sources on this show when they were right. The proof of point. I played the young Turks who are atheists when they're right. This is a teaching channel. And I'd be a punk to delete you, block you, sanction you. That's, that's a punk out. That's what other channels do. Moderators, get rid of this person. We don't do that over here. And if they've done it, I've already told my moderators, don't do that. We don't punk out over here. This is a teaching channel. And if we can't sit, that's why I believe that everybody, especially you preachers, should have watched by order <laughs> uh, the great debaters. Uh, what is his name? Denzel Washington and that, that young lady, whatever her name is. You should watch the great debaters. That's going to help y'all sit and talk with your people instead of being punks and walking away because they doesn't fit. They don't fit your agenda. <laughs> you know, yeah, I'm not scared of y'all. I'm going to stand 10 toes down. If I lose a toe, I'm going to stand nine toes down. All right. We fair and balanced over here. So the whole problem with this is, is y'all's immaturity. And if the shoe fit, you wear it. My dear brother, if this shoe don't fit you, you don't have to respond. You understand? But if this shoe fits you, then it applies. What are you afraid of? Hmm? What are you afraid of? I am able to take information. I don't care where it come from. And I eat the meat and I spit out the bone. Because I'm not tribal. Do you understand? I am a student at Moody Bible Institute. And I have several professors there. And we, we were told that some of the material that we have to purchase for our classes does not always represent. Moody Bible Institute, the staff, its founder, and everybody else. But you got to buy that book. It may not be a Christian apologetic book, but you got to buy it for this class. And the Holy Spirit will show you how to eat the meat and spit out the bone. You understand? So CNN was correct. Don't worry, next year it's going to fall on another day and then y'all can start fighting with whoever's in the office over that. That's it, Sarah. Pass the class and move on. Um, that's right, Sharon. If y'all going to be a good apologetic, you can't just be taking only Christian stuff. Study it all. Get the lesson. Mm -hmm. Here's what I know, even when it comes to you, when I listen a lot, but even with you, I, amen. Thank you, brother. Thank you. This is what I've been telling people for 10 years on my show. Don't just listen to me. Go to the books and be a good Berean. Take that stuff home because if you are listening to everything your pastors say as law, something wrong with you. 
That's why my, my pastor and I, we spend a lot of time in the corner. He'll say something over that pulpit that I disagree with, that I know is not theologically sound, and I quietly take him in the corner. Pastor, out of respect, that ain't Bible. And if we have a coming to Jesus meeting, y'all, they don't even know what's going on because we're too busy laughing and joking. And we high-fiving and hugging each other. They don't even know that we're fighting. But we, we're just having a great time. And then when we, when we walk away from each other, we've come to a consensus. Either we disagree, we agree to disagree, or we agree. I've never met a man or a woman that I've agreed with 100%. Do you understand? Eat the meat. Spit them bones out. So what day did he die? You know, it's important to know what day he died. I will never say it's not important. It is important because it must fit in a three-day sphere. It must. I don't believe he died on a Friday. Y'all already heard my teaching on that. I can do another teaching on this right now if, if you want me to. But if I do that, because... I've got notes on the Friday, the Thursday, and I got notes on the Wednesday crucifixion. All right? And if I can, but if I do, the show is going to be long. I'm a Thursday man. My plan B is a Wednesday. <laughs> Wednesday really fits. The Thursday is a safe zone. You understand? Based off of Noah. The three days and three nights. Jonah, that is, not Noah. It just fits. But I've already spent too much time in my pre to get to this lesson because I got a lot to go over. All right? Jerome believes it was a Wednesday. Sharon says Wednesday. All right? I believe it too. I'm going to go with Wednesday or Thursday. I'm going to go. They both. And then the more I, the more I study Wednesday, the more I'm almost convinced. Jerome, I was almost persuaded. I'm almost there. <clears throat> okay. Uh, so the Sunday school lesson starts at Hosea chapter six. Hosea chapter six is a is a difficult one. Mm -hmm. Uh. Blessings to you, Phyllis. So good to see you. Uh, how, how do I start this off? All right, here's how I have to start this off. I want you all to turn to Hosea chapter 5 instead of chapter 6. Okay? Hosea chapter 5 instead of chapter 6. Go back because I'm going to show you something that I think the Sunday school lesson attempted to tie. Hosea 6 with Luke chapter 24, the three-day discussion. They try to push that in. I disagree with bringing in Hosea chapter 6 to tie it in. You can do it, but I, contextually, there's a problem. Elder Rodney Jones taught two days on context, context, context with me last, when, last week, Monday and Tuesday. Remember that? Go back and watch it. If you're on Patreon.com, the So Walter Jones Show, I talk even more about genres. Join the upper room. 12 bucks, you in, and you can get all that seminary teaching. That will help you understand what the Sunday School lesson attempted to do here. If you turn to Hosea chapter 5, notice here it says, Hear this, you priests. That sounds familiar, don't it? It sounds just like Malachi chapter 2. Because typically we go to Malachi chapter 3 to push people into a tithing thing. Do you understand? It's a problem because Malachi wasn't talking to everybody. He was talking to the priests. Post it there, staff. Malachi chapter 2. What are the first few words there? Well, the same words are here. Hear this, you priests. Pay attention, you leaders of Israel. Listen, you members 
of the royal family. See what's happening here? Now, what he's doing here is giving each body attention. So he's talking about the priests, leaders of Israel, members of the royal family. I wonder who was that? Judgment has been handed down to who? You. Who was the you? These. Okay. For you have led the people into a snare by worshiping the idol Mizbah and Tabor. You have a deep, you have dug a deep pit to trap them at Acacia Grove. But I will settle with you for what you have done. And then he goes on. Ephraim, Israel, you left me as a prostitute leaves her husband. This is Hosea chapter five. It goes on and on. It is a, a whipping that God has given Israel. Okay. Notice that. Then when you get to today's lesson, Hosea chapter six, what does it say? Uh, where I want to read it. I want to read it where? Okay. Here. Hosea chapter 6. Here's what it says. Come, let us return to the Lord. All right? Sounds like Isaiah chapter 1. He said, your skin is putre putrefied. He says, away with your new moons and your holy convocations and and all the things that you do and your blood sacrifices and away with all that stuff. He said, you stank. I put my hand on my head. After he get through beating them, he says, now come, let us reason together. Though your sin be as scarlet, red like crimson. It goes on and on. All right. Well, it sounds like that's what happened here in Hosea. Hosea chapter five, God is beating them. Hosea chapter six, he says, come. Who's saying that, though? Come, let us return to the Lord. So the Lord ain't saying that. The people are. A call of repentance. Let us return to the Lord. He has torn us to pieces. <laughs> now he will heal us. He has injured us. Now, I'm going to go to King James. And this is why the Sunday school lesson did what it did. Here's what he said here in King James. Let us return unto the Lord, for he has torn and he will heal us. He has smitten and he will bind us up. After two days, he will revive us. Look at what he did here. And in the third day, he will raise us up and, we'll, and we shall live in his sight. Then shall we know if we follow on to know the Lord, his going forth is prepared as the morning, and he shall come unto us as the rain, as the latter and the former rain, and unto the earth. Now, pay attention to verse 2. After two days will he revive us. In the third day he will raise us up. You see what the Sunday school teachers decided to do? They decided to put this in here on the third day resurrection uh, of Luke chapter 24 because they, they see a similarity here. But there is one minute problem. When you look in the other translations, Hebrews chapter 6, let's go back to maybe NLT. Look what it says instead of saying the two day or the three day. What does it say here? Verse 2. In a short time, he will restore us so that we may live in his presence. Wait a minute. What happened to the two day? What happened to the three day? Why did it shorten it up and say in a short time? Because it wasn't literal. Remember we talked about word for word, meaning for meaning, thought for thought, and paraphrases the other day? Y'all remember we did all of this, right? Well, we told you how King James and um, these others gives us word for word. That's what the Sunday school lessons gave us the two day and the three day. But when you look at these other translations and what I just read is NLT, it gave you a thought for thought. And sometimes it gives you a paraphrase. 
on this chart here, the NLT gives you, they, they said the NLT is more thought for thought. But on this one, um, where is it? Then on this one, look where NLT is located. Okay. On this one, the NLT is not located for thought for thought. The NLT now was located in between thought for thought and paraphrase. This chart is correct. This is a teaching channel. If you can't take this kind of teaching, then we will be fighting over CNN and MSNBC and Fox. So why am I doing this? Well, let's go to the Bible hub for Hebrews chapter six. I'm sorry, Hosea chapter six and one. Let's look at what it's saying in the commentaries and see if we can agree with the commentaries about the two or three day. You understand? Here it's saying, come, let us return to the Lord. He has torn us to pieces, but he will heal us. He has injured us, but he will bind up our wounds. When you go down to the commentaries, let's see if they say anything. Look what it says here. Poopy commentary says, I'll read it for you because it's small. These three verses have by the division into chapter, by the division into chapters been violently and improperly torn from the preceding chapter. Violently to which they naturally belong. What are they saying here? I'm going to show you what they're saying here. Look at this. This is my Bible. It is what I said. It is. If you read my Bible, I don't have the, the previous page over here, but the previous page would say chapter five. All right. And then it continues down this, this roadmap here. And then what does it do? There's a break there. And that break is a new pericope, eventual restoration of Israel. But what it didn't do, it didn't put chapter six up here to start that pericope. No. What did it do? It just kept flowing. Chapter six flowed and never stopped. Chapter six flowed into chapter five. No subtopic. It just flowed. Okay. It flowed in. Why did it do that? It did that for the commentators say it was violently snatched. <laughs> Y'all understand? This is what they're saying here. It was violently snatched and placed in here. Let's go back and read it again. Here's where I agree with them. I don't always agree, but I agree here. It was violently snatched. He says violently and improperly torn from the preceding chapter to which they naturally belong. Their connection with the foregoing sentiments is indicated by the ancient versions and they give their, they, they cite you all, you always got to cite your sources. That's why I cited sin. <laughs> okay. Represents the, the Israelites exhortation one another in that good time, which the prophet encouraged them to expect. Right. Let's see. It may be regarded as the prophet's own exhortation to the exiles, their affliction, urging them to seek the Lord and their encouragement consisting in the knowledge of his ability and willingness to heal the wounds, which his own hands had, had conflicted. The presence of the pronoun imparts emphasis to the statement so that it is rather he it is that has torn and the preterite of this verse. It goes on. But I'm going to show you something here. This is Bible Hub 6.1. Let's go to 6.2, shall we? And Here it is. Two days third day okay third day third day they're saying third day 
third day. All right? Why did NLT say a short time? Hmm? I wonder why. Anybody else? Did anybody else say it? Anybody else say it? Okay. I can't see it. But look at this. The haste of the seeming penitence for the fulfillment of their hope. They expect the rapid restoration of the national prosperity prompted by the abundance of the divine love and his response to the first touch of penitence. Hosea 5.15. All right. After two days, it says a phrase sometimes used for the second day or tomorrow. Third day. After a short time. This and the above expression are not identical in the designation of time. I agree with Ellicott commentary. It is not identical in the designation of time. Some Christian interpreters like Jerome, Luther, and Pussy, remember him? <laughs> Consider the passage has sole reference to the resurrection of Christ. That's why the Sunday school lesson decided to use this. But Calvin, Henderson, Smoller, etc., and I'm not a Calvin, but let's go with it. We consider this to be contradicted by the form of the expression to bring in the resurrection of Christ with no authority from the New Testament is far fetched over refinement and breaks the consistency of the passage. This is seminary talk. It took me all this time to get to this point here that there was a violation, I believe, to use Hosea 6 as a literal three-day, two-day, three-day analogy to bring that into Jesus. I also agree with the commentator who says they violently snatched chapter 6, plucked it out of chapter 5, which it should have been a smooth flow. Mm -hmm. Y'all understand? Now, this may sound like brain surgeon to some of you. It may sound like it's too difficult. Listen, the good practice is to rewind this over and over. Go to Bible Hub for yourself. Go to other translations for yourself, whether it's word for word, dynamic equivalence, paraphrase, or whether it's thought for thought. And then you do the study for yourself and be good Bereans. Meanwhile, I'm going to continue by now going to Luke chapter 24. When we go to Luke chapter 24, now we can focus more so on Luke's gospel on what happened when Jesus rose. And let's find out what's going on with the women and the disciples. And why is it that even the women did not believe that he was going to be resurrected? I know women like to teach that the women was always there. Well, they were there. They was always there. But they, too, like the disciples, didn't remember Jesus saying, I got to get up. There is a uh, delusion theory out there on this. But very early on Sunday morning, the women went to the tomb taking the spices they had prepared. They found that the stone had been rolled away from the entrance. So they went in, but they didn't find the body of the Lord, of, uh, the Lord Jesus. Yes, they stood there puzzled. Two men suddenly appeared to them, clothed in dazzling robes. The women were terrified and bowed with their faces to the ground. Then the men asked, why are you looking among the dead for someone who was alive? He isn't here. He is risen from the dead. Remember when he told you back in Galilee? What does that say? The angels know what they believe. That the son of man must be betrayed into the hands of the sinful man and be crucified. And then he would rise again on the third day. Then they remembered that he said this. You see? The women went to the tomb because they didn't believe or 
they didn't remember. Here is saying, then they remembered. When Jesus said it, they heard it. When Jesus said it, the disciples heard it. But here's the problem. Believing in the resurrection was di very difficult, which is why we have the Sadducees. The Sadducees didn't believe in the resurrection of the body. Nor did Martin Luther King Jr. <laughs> Notice I read his work. I read his seminary work. He said if a body, if someone must, if someone is resurrected to something, they must be resurrected from a place. Remember I read that? So it was not something that happened back then. Men or women did not die and then come back to life. They, wasn't, they just wasn't used to seeing something like that. Even though someone as miraculous as Jesus was doing what he was doing, they were like, they were like, whatever. Okay. So everybody, nobody either believed or remembered if, if they, here's the thing. This is me. If they believed, they would have remembered. This is me. You all don't teach this to your churches because they're going to throw you out of church. If they believed, they would have remembered. Number two. So if they believed and, and remembered, the women would not have went to the body to prepare spices. They would have just stayed home or they would have been at that tomb all three days waiting for Jesus to get up. Do you understand? Am I upsetting you all? I'm glad I am. <laughs> I'm, I'm glad. All right, let's go back. Let's go back. Then they remembered. So they rushed back from the tomb to tell his 11 disciples. Huh. His 11 disciples. Ooh, tomorrow's show is going to be quite interesting. Tomorrow night, you, you, you don't want to miss it. You don't want to miss it because we've got to talk about uh, this preaching on Judas. We've got, we, we, we got to talk about that. And everyone else, what had happened, it was Mary Magdalene, Joanna, Mary the mother of James, and several other women who told the apostles what had happened. But the story sounded like nonsense to them. Why would that story sound like nonsense if they believed? They didn't believe, which make them not remember. <laughs> so they didn't believe. They didn't believe the story that was just told to them. However, Peter jumped up, ran to the tomb to look. There was something in Peter that was sparked. Stooping, he peered in and saw the empty linen wrapped wrappings. Then he went home again, wondering what happened. He still didn't know what happened, even though. All right. This is Luke's gospel. Peter wasn't the only one, remember? But Peter was the only one Luke decided to write about. Number two, there was something inside of Peter that Jesus wanted to use. This is why when Jesus got up out the grave, he said, go and tell my disciples and who else? Why would he pick that guy out? And then he's sitting, having a nice scrumptious meal with them. He turns to Peter and asks him, do you love me? He asked him three times. Why is he spending that much time with Peter? Because Jesus knew there was something in Peter that is in many of us. You understand? Something in Pete that's in many of us. Hard, hard head and hot headed. Uh, not patient. Belligerent. Very warlike. He all over the place. He's unstable as water. And the, the conversations that Jesus was having with Peter all throughout this, his, his, the time that he selected Peter was like, Pete, come on, bro. Jesus was like high-fiving Pete. Hey, who y'all say that I am? Some say Elias. Some say Jeremiah. Pete like, man, listen, you are Jesus Christ, the son of the living God. And Jesus was like, Pete, you are the man. You're the man. And on this rock, I'll build my church. Petra, 
Petros, male, female, was he calling Peter the rock? We all like to do that to, to the point where we're calling our churches Peter Rock Church. Peter's Rock Church. <laughs> all right. And then Jesus says, I must die. And then Peter turns on Jesus. Whoa, no, no, you ain't. And then Jesus then turns on him saying, you know, Satan comes to sift you as we. Peter's the one that decides to take the ear off of a man. Because, and, and Jesus has to rebuke him again. Listen, he that lives by the sword died by the sword. And then God has got to deal with Pete by saying, rise, Peter, slay and eat this. Pete, like, I can't eat that. God's like, you, come on, ain't nothing that I made is not clean. You need to eat that because God was trying to prepare him for the Gentiles, for the pagan world. Pete was always there acting a the fool. And then finally the Paul comes on the scene and then Pete is eating with the Gent uh, with the uh, with the Jews until he sees the Gentiles coming and Paul has to rebuke him in his face. Pete is just a wild ass. A wild ass. And some of you are. I know I was and I still am wild ass. I can't always get it right. I am unorthodoxed in some of my ways, but my unorthodoxy is labeled that by people who are not orthodox. I believe in biblical orthodoxy. They teach it an erroneous way, many of them, even a part of my, my denomination, Church of God in Christ, Pentecostals, they think it's orthodoxy, but it's not. It is it's errancy and it is eisegetical teachings. That's the problem. So they think I'm unorthodox in my teaching, but I'm actually teaching it right, at least as much as I think I am. <laughs> you understand? So Peter is like all of many of us, many of the bunkers and myself. We just wild, but God, but Jesus knew that there was something special about that boy. He wound up being one of the greatest apostles out there. He gave us the first Peter, second Peter. Some of the greatest writings came from him. And he was part of the inner circle. Who was the ones who was able to go on the Mount of Transfiguration to see Jesus right? Who? 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 Peter, James, John. Pete, Pete was always there. Made many mistakes, stumbled and fell. But Jesus comes back and say, I want that guy. So the apostle Paul was the same way. This guy was killing everybody, persecuting, jailing folks. And God said, I want that guy. So when you find somebody in your family and in your, 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 maybe, maybe it's your wife, your, your husband, maybe it was a child of yours, maybe it's, it's somebody in your circle and they acting all wild and crazy and different, what have you, that might be the one that God is using based off of that characteristics of this wild man, that might be the one that God is going to use to save the world. <laughs> yes, you may want to be a Pete because that's the one Jesus comes back for. John talking about some and the disciple that Jesus loved. He getting all excited saying that he's the favorite of, of Jesus. Running around here naked and stuff. But Peter is the one that Jesus calls directly. Pete, go tell Pete. Y'all understand? All right. So now we've got to fix the timeline because there's some timeline issues here with the story. There's some timeline issues here. Let me, let me see how I can fix this for some of you who just need some fixings. Right, we've got to go back to Bible Hub. Now let's look at this. I can't write on this one, so I'll, you have to bear with me. On the first day of the week, very early in the morning, the women took the spices they had prepared and went to the tomb. All right. When you go down here, early in the morning, early in the morning, why you want to? Anyway, the original has a more poetic form in the deep dawn, agreeing with the with while it was yet dark. The last clause 
certain others with them is not found and may have been inserted by transcribers to bring in the second group who are named in other gospels, but not in this gospel. Y'all understand what they're saying here. All right. So the resurrection, now look at this, look at this. This is a pulpit commentary and I agree with pulpit. <clears throat> All the four evangelists give an account of the resurrection. Matthew, Mark, Luke, John, you get that? None of the four, however, attempts to give a history of it simply from a human point of sight. Mm. Four guys seeing, let's assume, it, all right, because all the writers were not there. Okay. Four guys are receiving this account, but decides to tell it in four different ways. Does it make it wrong? No. Are there inconsistencies? No. Atheists, agnostics, and some of you may want to see insig insignificant inconsistency, that is, but how many times have they done this test where they put 10 people in, the ch in, in chairs and this, they tell the first guy a story. And this first guy got to tell the next guy the same story. Can y'all tell me what's going to happen by the time this story get to the 10th person? Hmm. This is what's happening in the four Gospels. You tell me the story. And I'm going to tell the story, the second guy, I may tell it word for word. But by the time it gets to the third person, it's thought for thought. By the time it gets to the fourth person, it's paraphrased. By the time it gets to the last person, the, the, the person in the first story is not a black couple anymore. It's an Asian couple by the time you get. <laughs> Y'all understand? This is what's happening here. It's, it's not that they are telling falsities, but it's that what was important to what they see, they decided to write. If you take five writers, prolific writers, and tell them to write about what happened on January the 6th, you're going to get five different tales. All five of them are going to probably tell you the truth. But all five of them are going to tell you the truth by their own lens. And, and they're going to tell you the truth based off of their audience. You see, I can't talk like this. Like I do, you bunkers. I can't talk like this at Faith Temple in the pulpit. I can't. Why? Because my audience at Faith Temple won't be able to handle my antics. I am, I am animated sometimes, and I, I go left over here, and I say some, again, unorthodox stuff. I can say that to you all because you all can handle it. But that audience at Faith Temple can't handle what I say, so I have to make sure I don't say certain things and insert it here because there's a whole mother's board sitting on my right with white on and big hats with apples and oranges in there. I can't talk this way with, to them. So I, I can't, I'm not going to lie, but there's some things I won't say. I'll just say what we agree with. You understand? And they say, when in Rome, you do what the Romans do. I, I'm not going to do that either. <laughs> but the Romans going to hear me, but I'm not, I'm going to do my best. To teach it in a way that they can understand it, you see. That's what's happening here. These four Gospels spoke to a certain audience. <laughs> Sharon said, you just, <laughs> you just special. <laughs> uh-huh. <coughs> the telephone game, yes, does not work with the Word of God. That's it. Somebody's going to change words or add words, and this is why, the Passion Bible is heresy, and the new Gen Z chat GPT Bible is heresy, and many of the other translations are heretics 
because that's exactly what they did. They took their original story and they changed it for a particular audience. You can't do this with the word of God. If you do, you don't change the story. But what you do is you tell it in a way that current English may understand it. So the NLT and uh, uh, many of the thought for thought translations that we do have tells it in a way where we can understand it without removing and taking away the important stuff. It just tell you on a third day, Hosea said, but if you look at an original transcript and not original, we don't have the original an earlier transcript, then we might see that the original transcript of uh, early transcript or a transcript that came from the dead sea scrolls told them in Hebrew that it wasn't a third day, that it meant many days. That's what NLT did. Do you understand what I'm saying? <laughs> am I upsetting some of you? I hope I am. So, all Bibles don't use the Textus Receptus. King James does. Others use other earlier manuscripts to get to the point that where they release their translations. All right. With that being said, all four Gospels, none of the four have an attempt to give a history of it simply, of it simply from a human point. Each Gospel probably produces the special points dwelt on in certain great centers of Christian teaching in what we should now term different schools of thought. You get it? Different schools of thought. I can't write on this, so I hope you saw it. Attempts have been made by theological scholars to classify these as Jewish, Gentile, Greek, Roman, Jewish, Matthew, Gentile, Mark, Greek, Luke, Roman, John. You understand? But only with indifferent success. The teaching which St. Matthew's gospel represents eventually, I'm sorry, evidently in the resurrection preaching dwelt with peculiar insistence on the great Galilean appearance of the risen. But St. Luke confines himself exclusively to the appearance in Judea. St. John chooses for his resurrection instruction scenes, which had for the, their theater, both Galilee and Judea. St. John as his central or most detailed piece of teaching dwells on a fishing scene in the Gennesaret. The actors being the well-known inner circle of the apostles. You see what they're saying here. I like what pulpit commentary is doing here, giving a wonderful breakdown of why did they leave this out? Because did not the women see Jesus, but they didn't recognize him? But we see the gospel here didn't, didn't even mention that. Why? Because. It wasn't that it didn't happen. It was that I don't, that's, I don't, I'm not focusing on that. I need to focus on this because of my audience needs to know this. And if I'm talking to a Jewish audience, they may need to know this. A Roman audience may need to know it like this. Same story. Let's focus on this. Again, it's like how CNN and MSNBC talk to a liberal audience and they praise Biden and the Democratic Party. Fox praises Trump and the Republican Party. They speak to their demographics. You understand? Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. So that's 24 and 1. Let's see what 24 and 2 says. They found the stone rolled away. Uh, let's look at this one. Three. But they, but when they entered, they did not find the body 
of the Lord Jesus. Well, let's go down. I told y'all it was going to be long. Uh, I, I, I thought it was some commentary there. Um, it wasn't. It is, but you have to go to another page for that. Okay, what happened? What I do, what I do. I'm going to have to refresh this page because I don't know what happened. Okay, you, you, you're wasting time, wasting days and wasting nights. While they were wondering about this, suddenly two men in clothes that gleamed like lightning stood before them. Look at that. He's saying two men. Let's see. I haven't read this yet. Uh, two men. St. Mark and St. Matthew mentions only one. Had St. Matthew given the two, it might have been urged by, by adverse critics that this duplication of phenomena, as in the case of the demoniac. Oh, I see what they're doing here. Remember, the man was cutting in the graves. We often talk about the one, but two people were cutting. You get it? So how many were there? One gospel speak of two people demoniac when we teach it we teach on the one why because the other one we don't hear from jesus deals with this one although he dealt with the two he's talking to this one the same thing happened to both of them they two of them were there look at the thieves on the cross both thieves rallied, rallied or riled against Jesus. Both of them did. But every time we talk about the one thief, we often talk about him having a repentive mindset right away. We never talk about his, his previous thought. He hated Jesus too on the cross while he was on the cross. They both were like, Jesus, how ridiculous is all three of us up here? Both of them did it. And then something hit that boy. He repented on the cross. You got to read all four Gospels to get the full story. Thank you, Dinah. They reviled. Mm -hmm. Both of them. So that's what, that's what this, this is what he's saying here. St. Matthew gives two. It might have been urged by adverse critics. Uh, let's see. And the, and the blind man at Jericho was an idiosyncrasy of his. As it is, we must suppose that each set of informants, the two Marys and the others from whom it seems probable that St. Luke's report was derived or described what they themselves had seen. At such moments of terror and astonishment, perception and memory are not always very defined in their reports. You see that? I'm going to read that part again so that you can get it. I need you to get this part if you ain't got nothing. Psychologically speaking, at some moments of terror and astonishment, perception and memory are not always very definite. Mm hmm in their reports or defined your vision is blurred because of terror and astonishment. That stuff is still there, but people who are shocked at an event, their perception, they see that which really moves them and they don't see this other stuff that other people see. And it is unlike the, what do you call it? When people, when an event happened, when the event didn't happen, but people did believe it happened. I'm not talking about the South African, the name after the South African president. What's his name? The Mandela, is that what it's called? It's not the Mandela effect. The Mandela effect that didn't happen, but a generation believes that it did. <laughs> like publishers clearinghouse Ed McMahon 
was selling Publix as quick. Well, he wasn't. <laughs> we thought he did. I thought he did. Ed McMahon, he wasn't. That is the Mandela effect. In as many cases, can y'all think of another Mandela effect? Well, this is unlike it. These things happen, but five people saw this thing happen, but one or two people are focusing on this one thing, and they may not even remember seeing this other stuff. You understand? Is it making any sense? Four to five sand singers in a mic of tune. There's just play. <laughs> Where's Danny? What is Danny doing? Bless it to you, Westbrook. Thank you for the super chat. All right. <laughs> Delita said, <laughs> you need to go on time out. Okay. I think y'all got the picture. I think y'all want me to stop as well. I'm going to read something to get a, a, a final analysis. Yes, yeah, a type of false memory that occurs when many different people incorrectly remember the same thing. It refers to a widespread false memory that Nelson Mandela died in prison in the 1980s. Yes. Yes, Marlene. Yes. That's a great one. Costco or Costco. That's a great one right there. Yep. Which one is it again? Is it with the T? It's the T, right? <laughs> That's a great one. A PTSD can cause you to forget very fast. Yes, Hicks, that's, that is so true. Uh, thank you, Sheila Mahoney. <laughs> Man, listen, if Sheila Mahoney blessing me, I must be teaching fire down. Fire down. Dorothy's socks and shoes in the Wizard of Oz. Ah, the socks were white and the shoes didn't have bows. But now the socks are blue and the shoes have wow. See? That I didn't know. Jiff or Jiffy. Yes. <laughs> yes, Marlene. I love it. I love it. Okay, Cheryl says it is Costco with a T. That's what I thought. That's what I thought. All right. I think I think y'all understand the Sunday school lesson here. Now let me let me let me fix this. Let me give you the timeline. OK, I'm going to give you a timeline of what happened and then we all can go. All right. Don't go nowhere, y'all. I'm putting this up. Let you know we at the end. But you ain't, don't go nowhere because I got to fix this. For those of you who are trying to figure out how do we fix this? <laughs> all right, first of all, why didn't the disciples always recognize and why didn't the, the women always recognize Jesus? First of all. The Bible does not specifically tell us why the following, the followers, his followers uh, did not recognize him, uh, you know, Jesus after his resurrection. As a result, some of the followers is following uh, is speculation. Keeping this in mind, there are a few things that might have contributed to the disciples not recognizing Jesus immediately when he first appeared to them after the resurrection. First, even though Jesus had predicted that he would rise again on the third day, the disciples did not fully understand it. Mark chapter 9, 32. Put that in their staff. Nine, Mark 9, 32. Because clearly they were not looking for him to be resurrected. This can account for some of their surprise and shock uh, when they did see him. So one of the instances where Jesus was not recognized was Mary Magdalene coming to the tomb early in the morning that we, that we mentioned. Instead of recognizing Jesus, she first mistook him for the gardener. One thing that is important to remember that if, if uh, we do not know how far Mary was from Jesus when she misidentified him, it could be that she was simply too far to simply recognize who he was until he spoke to her. All right. That's one thought. Second, we must remember that since it was very early in the morning, the light would not have been very bright which could also have made it more difficult for her to see him clearly. So when we couple that with the fact that she was not expecting to see him alive, it is easy to see why she did not recognize him from a distance until he spoke to her. You understand? A second instance in which Jesus was not immediately recognized was when the disciples did not recognize him when they were out fishing. John chapter 21, 4, put that staff, John 21, Verse four, 
This could also be related to the distance Jesus might have been from them. A third instance is when the two disciples on the road to Emmaus did not recognize Jesus until he, he broke bread with them. Remember, they said, did not our hearts burn? How could these two disciples have walked, talked, eat with Jesus without recognize him, recognizing him? In this instance, it seems that they were supernaturally, supernaturally, it seems, prevented from recognizing Jesus. Jesus perhaps had taken on a different appearance to keep himself from being recognized. Uh, like um, Joseph, when the brothers saw him, they didn't recognize him either. Why would Jesus have done this? The Bible does not say. Perhaps Jesus veiled his identity so that the two disciples would truly think through the things Jesus was saying, rather than accepting the teachings blindly as they likely would have if they had known it was Jesus. So what we can know for certain is that it was Jesus himself who appeared to them because of all of the testimonies of those who saw the resurrected Christ. There was a witness of the remarkable change that took place in the lives of the disciples. And immediately before and after the crucifixion, the 11 apostles were in hiding and in fear, yet they're, uh, after spending considerable time with the resurrected Christ, they became fearless evangelists proclaiming the gospel boldly, no matter how strong the op opposition was. And all eventually gave their lives for the sake of the gospel. They all died, most of them, I believe, a brutal, brutal deaths, martyred lives. But now we've got to come to a conclusion about the resurrected and variations of the resurrection accounts and how do we harmonize it? Okay. The events surrounding Jesus resurrection can be difficult to place together, but we must remember two things. First, the news of Jesus resurrection produced much excitement in Jerusalem and in the ensuing chaos, many people were going many different directions Groups were separated, and several different groups paid visits to the tomb, possibly more than once. Second, the writers of the Gospels did not attempt an exhaustive narrative. In other words, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John had no intentions of telling us every detail. Who was that? The, the John says, if, we, if I had written everything that Jesus had done, the, the, the books, the libraries could not contain it. All right? So not every detail of the resurrection story or even events in order that it, that it happened. So in the battle with skeptics regarding Jesus' resurrection, Christians are in a no-win situation. So I don't fight atheists over uh, the inconsistencies. I just don't do it. If the resurrection account harmonized perfectly, trust me, skeptics will claim that the writers of the gospel conspired together. Do you understand? There's a reason and a rhyme what God does. His timing is everything. If the resurrection accounts have some differences, skeptics will claim that the gospels contradict each other and therefore cannot be trusted. It is our contention that the resurrection, the resurrection that is, accounts can be harmonized and do not contradict each other. Hassle never. Even if the resurrection accounts cannot be perfectly harmonized, that does not make them untrustworthy by any reasonable uh, evaluation. The resurrection accounts from the four gospels are superbly consistent eyewitness testimonies. And the central truth that Jesus was resurrected from the dead and that the resurrection of Jesus appeared to many people are clearly taught in the, each of the four gospels. The apparent inconsistencies are in the side issues. How many angels did they see in the tomb? One or two, really? Y'all going to fight over that? Perhaps one person saw one angel while the other person saw two. To how many women did Jesus appear and to whom he appeared first? Y'all going to fight over that? While each gospel has a slightly different sequence to the appearance, none of them claims to be given the precise chronological order. None of them say this happened first, this happened second, this happened third. So while the resurrection accounts may seem to be inconsistent, it cannot be proven that the accounts are contradictory. So the burden of proof is on the unbeliever. <laughs> 
here is a possible harmony of the narratives of the resurrection of Christ and his post-resurrection appearance in chronological order. I'm getting ready to give it to you. You can rewind this or pause it in between it so you can get the full picture. And I'm going to go and put something in my belly. Number one, and then I'm not going to count from there. Jesus is buried as several women watch. Next, the tomb is sealed as a guard is set. Next, at least three women, including Mary Magdalene, Mary the mother of James, and Salome, prepare spices to go to the tomb. Next, an angel descends from heaven, rolls the stone away, and sits on it. Then an earthquake, and the guards faint. Next, the women arrive at the tomb and find it empty. Mary Magdalene leaves the other women there and run to tell the disciples. Next, the women still at the tomb see the two angels who tell them that Jesus is risen and who instruct them to tell the disciples to go to Galilee. Next, the women leave to bring the news to the disciples. Next, the guards, having roused themselves, report the empty tomb to the authorities who bribed the guards to say that the body was stolen. Next, Mary, the mother of James and the other women on the way to find the disciples. Then they see Jesus. Next, the women relate what they have seen and heard to the disciples. Next, Peter and John run to the tomb, see that it is empty and find grave clothes. Next, Mary Magdalene returns to the tomb. She sees the angels and then she sees Jesus. Next, later the same day, Jesus appears to Peter. Next, still, still on the same day, Jesus appears to Cleopas, Cleopas and another disciple on their way to Emmaus. Next, that evening, the two disciples report the event in uh, to the, who? the 11 in Jerusalem. Next, Jesus appears to 10 disciples. Thomas ain't there. Next. Jesus appears to 11 disciples. Thomas is there. Next. Jesus appears to seven disciples by the Sea of Galilee. Next. Jesus appears to 500 disciples in Galilee. Next. Jesus appears to his half-brother, James. Next. Jesus commissions his disciples. Next. Jesus teaches his disciples the scriptures and promise to send the Holy Spirit <sighs> blows. Next, Jesus ascends to heaven. And those two guys, angels, are standing there watching those guys gaze. And they say, why sit ye here gazing? That same Jesus who went up from this mountain is going to come back down. Next, we see in Zechariah chapter 14, that same Jesus is going to come right back down. His feet is going to touch that same mountain and it's going to split in half from the east to the west. Now, the rest is up to you. <laughs> the rest it's up to you. Because if you don't know Jesus as your personal Savior who pardoned your sin, the rest is up to you. You can be there standing in good graces with him or you can be there on your way to an eternal damnation. You see, the rest it's up to you. God, thank you for your presence. Thank you for your blood. The people who don't believe, I pray that one day they will. That they're going to listen to this teaching. And they're going to hear the unadulterated word of God coming from this preacher. And they're going to wake up and say, what 
is it that I must do to be saved? And then the Holy Spirit would come into their lives immediately and baptize them. Feel them. Set them apart. They are now anointed. Cover them. Shield them. And then you will be in them. They will be in you. And you, Holy Spirit, and the Father will lead and guide them all the days of their life. And behind them are those twins, grace and mercy. I know this for a fact because the rest was up to me one day. And I decided to take the choice. What was the choice? You say, I have given you life and I've given you death. And then you gave the answer. You cheated on the test. What professor gives the answers to the test that will give me the right to have a license to do what I do? God is the only one who cheats on the test. He said, here's the test of the emergency broadcast system. This is only a test. I'm giving you life and I'm giving you death. I'm getting ready to give you the answer. Choose life. And millions from around the world decided, even though the teacher told them, here's the answer, they decided to choose death. So God, the rest is up to them. Many of these people here chose life, and I'm so glad. And the day is gonna come when you're gonna say, welcome, come on in to the presence of the Lord, thy good and faithful servant. God, we thank you for what you're doing, doing in their lives right now. Allow them to run, run out there and tell, tell the Great Commission, baptizing them in the name of the Father, Son, and Holy Ghost. Let them know in teaching the people out there that Jesus do live, and he lives within my heart today. We love you, God, and we give your name to praise in Jesus' name. Thank God. Amen and amen. All right, y'all. Listen, I pray uh, that this teachings have done something for you. And if it did, you can support the channel however you way you want to. You, you, you're doing it because it goes into good ground. The bunkers here know it goes into good ground. <laughs> we try and portal our resources. It, 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 it's a con conduit. The finances come in, it goes right back out to those in need. So you get to the cash app or you want to support us through patreon.com, the Sir Arthur Jones Show, in the upper room or any of the other five, five dollar rooms. You are supporting me through college. Trust me, I'm learning so much and this has only been a year. <laughs> well, it, it'll be a year at the end of this semester. It will be a year. I went in there feeling like a dummy. <laughs> Oh, but I'm much smarter today because you all have been supporting me in Patreon.com. I love y'all. Take care of yourselves and one another. Yes, we do have all of that. PayPal, Zelle, P.O. Box, all of that is in the description. Well, I don't know if I put it in here yet, but go to any, any YouTube video and in the description. All of the ways of giving is on any YouTube video. I'm about to put it on this one after the show. All right, see y'all tomorrow, movie night. What am I going to play? I don't know. It's Easter. I don't know, but I don't want to do no long, long Passion of the Christ or something like that. That's too long, too long, too long. Too bloody, too, too, too bloody, too, too bloody. So <laughs> we'll figure out what to do. We'll do something nice and cute and cuddly for tomorrow. All right? Meanwhile, see y'all. Uh, we'll try to do a show tomorrow night about 8 o'clock. Okay? Let's try it. Meanwhile, Sunday School uh, University, this Tuesday, Zoom, private Zoom, this Tuesday, Bunkers, meet me over there. The Lord's going to give me something. I don't know what, but he's going to give me something. This Tuesday, 7 p.m. Central Standard Time, Zoom. See y'all over there, me, Beatrice Carter, uh, Dinah, Review, <laughs> and, and Amber Rogers, and our staff will be over there waiting for you to come on in. Right. If you need the information, it will be on Patreon.com. It's already there. Go to Collections on Patreon, and all of the sign-up stuff is there. You ain't even got to send me no email anymore.
the storm clouds form, hear the cries of doom and gloom. Sunday school still marches on. Then when the grass turn green and the flowers start to bloom, Sunday school still marches on. Marches on. Marches on. Sunday school still marches on, marches on, marches on. Sunday school still marches, Sunday school still marches, Sunday school still marches on. It's 10 p.m. Do you know where your children are? <laughs>